Oh, this has been terrific having Mel way over there, thousands of miles away, back again. Hi, Mel. Listen, it's good to have you back on the Dome of the Rock. We're still on the Dome of the Rock, and we want to continue with what you have been introducing to us. It's fascinating because we're spending an awful lot of time on the Dome of the Rock, and uh, we've been doing look at the inscriptions with Joe and finding out that even the inscriptions look like they're talking about Jesus. They're not talking about Muhammad at all. The Shahada, the original Shahada, it's actually, it actually could be by looking and taking off the dots or putting on the dots, you can actually, by changing the dots around, you can actually make it, it shows that this is to Jesus, not to anybody named Muhammad. Now, we're going to continue with the Dome of the Rock, looking at A.J. Deuce's research. You have looked at it, you have researched it, you've unpacked it, and now you're communicating it to us. And uh, Thanks so much for coming on board. I know you're in contact with A.J. Deuce. He is thanking you for the good work that you have done and continue. In fact, he said, didn't he, um, Mel, he said to you, it's so good you're putting this stuff up because I, he doesn't have the time or the energy, nor does he have a platform that's large enough. Uh, he was saying that maybe only 50 to 60 people will read his article, his papers, whereas tens of thousands will look at these videos. So in some ways, we're both, both doing each other a favor. Dios is doing the research. You're actually understanding it. You're putting it into PowerPoints. Yeah. You're, you're sharing it on Origins, and I'm sharing it on this channel, Fander Film. So we're getting both platforms. We're really pushing this out and getting it out to the whole world out there. Look, you're going to continue, though, because there's some more you want to bring up. And you're actually going to, I think, go back to the 7th century and tell us that nothing survived from the 7th century, which is... Listen, this is going to blow everybody's mind because we've always, always been told that narrative has always been, and it's not just the standard Islamic narrative. The academics have always said this, all of the academics in every school, that it was built in 691, 692, that those inscriptions we're looking at are the original part of the building. Not the outside, the inside, the ambulatories. You're going to even dispute that. Over to you. I want to see where you're going to go with this. This is going to be fun. Thanks, Mel, for coming on board. My pleasure. Okay, so I'm going to just share. All right, so before we get stuck in today, um, let's review what we've seen in the last two videos. So we've seen the absence of early attestations to the inscriptions. And why is this important? Inscriptions without attestations are artifacts without provenance. Now, if you go to um, an antique store and you try and buy an artifact that's supposed to be a few centuries old, the first thing you will ask for is provenance, some sort of proof that it, it, it was created at the time it's supposed to have been created. Now, unfortunately, without any witnesses to these inscriptions from the early centuries, how do we know that these are from the early centuries? All, all we know is the writing looks like it does, but that's not good enough evidence because anyone can copy it. The second thing that we saw was that the style of the mosaics was anachronistic. It looks like it came from a much later time. That, to me, is fishy. Uh, obviously, there are sometimes exceptions to the rule. Sometimes uh, mosaics can be ahead of its time. But when we look at it in the context of all the other evidence, it kind of builds a case for it not being from the 7th century. What we're looking at now today is then... Um, how unlikely that inscriptions could have survived from the 7th century had they existed, okay? So, there are two inscriptions that attest to the dome's restoration after an earthquake in 1015, 1016. The biggest threat to the notion that inscriptions and mosaics could have survived from the 7th century until today was an earthquake in 1015, 1016, uh, that caused the dome to fall onto an enshrined rock. Two inscriptions attest to the restoration of the collapsed dome in 1022. And this is taken from AJ Juice's paper. Um, I've given you an example of a collapsed dome in Indonesia. So you can see how devastating an earthquake can be. Um, if, if we think about the fact that there was a drum under the, the dome, and if that had collapsed, it would have caused colossal damage all around it, including the, um, the arcades, which contain the inscriptions. So is it likely that those inscriptions would have survived unscathed? Today's arcades with inscriptions rest on columns that had been replaced after the early ones were destroyed. AJ Juice says, the descriptions of the time are markedly different from the modern appearance. 
While the main walls appear to be the same with exact measurements given, the arrangement of the inner supporting columns is so different that another destructive event must have consumed weaker uh, parts of the structure. So as you can see there, if the columns underneath were replaced, uh, how is it that the arcades above, including the inscriptions, how would they have survived if the columns um, were replaced, they were destroyed? Now, imagine a house of cards, okay? Imagine what would happen if you, if you have built a house of cards and you knock the cards underneath. What do you think would have happened to the top deck? It would have fallen as well. That's what you would expect. At the very least, you'd expect massive damage to the arcades above, but we see no sign of damage, no sign of repair work on the inscriptions. So this would indicate that whenever they were made, it was after the period of this reconstruction. Now, if we look at the, the difference in the number of columns, okay? So the, the image on the left is an imagined ground plan based on the number of columns that existed. Okay, so there were eight inner supporting columns and 24 outer columns in the image on the left. Whereas today we have 12 inner supporting columns and 16 outer columns. So you can't just pull out columns and replace them and expect everything to hold together. Usually you have to build from the ground up. Okay, um, so the indication is that if the columns have changed, then whatever was above it would have changed as well as a result. Okay. Mosaic surviving with no visible repairs is inconceivable. AJ Juice says that given that the dome is carried by the inner columns, it is unimaginable that mosaics would have survived such a structural undertaking without major repairs being necessary and visible to the mosaics. Likewise, mosaics and dedicatory inscriptions on the inner octagonal arcade could not have survived such structural changes. Um, whenever someone has to replace a wall in a house, particularly if the wall is load bearing, they usually have to put in struts and they have to make sure it is properly supported before they take the wall out. Um, but the likelihood is unless you do it perfectly, there's going to be cracks in the, the wall area above that um, because it's, there's nothing supporting it, you know? So, it's really difficult to do that without causing cracks and damage to the, um, the mosaics above. Um, indeed, just a few years later, in 1033 AD, multiple earthquakes hit the area and caused mass casualties. This is on top of the earlier earthquake. The outer wall of the harem area was thrown down. The Al-Aqsa mosque was also seriously damaged. Yet we are to believe that the mosaic survived unscathed. So I asked my audience here, is, is it possible that you could have this amount of damage and yet the mosaics managed to miraculously survive without any damage? Do you want to come in on any of that, Jay? No, this is good. But I'm going to comment on all of this, but I'm going to wait till you finish because to me, this, this is a no-brainer, what you're talking about. The fact that these earthquakes, I mean, just those diagrams, but let me hold on, finish what you're saying. I want to come back because there's, this is hugely, to me, this is significant. Now, the Persian Nasir visits the site in 1047 AD. He identified the dedication of Al Mamun on one of these gates, but not in the Dome of the Rock. Okay. He doesn't mention the, the famous Al Mamun inscription in in the arcades, something else is there. From the interior, he merely mentions the unique woodwork for the ceiling and roofing. Now, from all the images I've seen of the interior of the Dome of the Rock, woodwork is not something that springs to mind for the ceiling. Um, I would have thought of mosaics, but he doesn't mention that, he mentions woodwork. He also provides for a detailed account of removable interior decorations and the supernatural rock itself. He is silent about mosaics and inscriptions. Now, you'd be hard pressed to imagine that he's talking about the same place um, that we're talking about today. It seems like it was very different. So he's saying that essentially there's no reference to mosaics, no reference to inscriptions, and he's describing the interior as very different to what it is today with woodwork on, on display. 
The Andalusian jurist Ibn al-Arabi visited the Dome of the Rock around 1092 to 95 AD, but leaves no description of Abdul al-Malik's mosaics or inscriptions. So you'd expect if the mosaics and inscriptions were there, that he of all people would have mentioned them, considering he would have spoken Arabic, and yet he doesn't mention them. In 1106, 1107 AD, we have the first mention of the interior mosaics. The Russian abbot Daniel visited the Holy Land in 1106 and left detailed descriptions that include the first mention of interior mosaics. While this is the first such description from shortly after the Crusaders had captured Jerusalem, it is too general an overview, and it does not mention the all-important inscriptions. Now, we have another witness, uh, 1322, that describes dramatically different dimensions from the current Dome of the Rock. John Mandeville had supposedly been in Jerusalem around 1322. He testifies to having personally witnessed the Muslim rituals in the Dome of the Rock and describes the building as simple, just as commanded in the Bible, which ADJ says, which would not be simple, but richly decorated. But here is the key thing, is that he says it was twice as high as wide. The dominant exterior feature being marble pillars all round. It should be noted that the Dome of the Rock today is not twice as high as it is wide, but about three quarters high as it is wide. So we're talking about a dramatically different building in 1322 from what it is today. But try to draw the geometry of what was said. Given that the outer octagonal is documented, we are now looking at a sizable tower, double the height of the current structure. No one seems to see the mosaics or the inscriptions. Um, so as you can see, we're not really finding the sort of evidence that we would expect. It, there seems to be a lot of changes going on from century to century. Um, what we would have expected is at the very least, at least, by the 12th century, we'd expect a clear reference to the inscriptions that says that Abdul Malik, or at least Al Mamun, had created the Dome of the Rock. We don't see that. We see a vague mention of mosaics at this point, but there's no clear indication that it's the same mosaics as we have today. Uh, we also saw a description of the interior, which had a uh, mention of woodwork instead of mosaics as well. Um, so there's a lot of confusing witness accounts here, but it doesn't really add up to um, a picture that we could say we have high confidence that there were inscriptions that had come from the 7th century. We can see that the Dome of the Rock had been reconstructed after earthquakes, um, and it is highly unlikely that any inscriptions, had they existed, would have survived all of that uh, turmoil and destruction. So I'll hand it back to you, Jay. Well, this is uh, this is highly damaging. This, I, I mean, I'm to me, this is a no-brainer. I think this is quite easy, what you've, what you've pointed here, uh, Mel. When you look, and this is what we've always asked. We've said this over and over again. Make sure that if you're going to talk about something, if you're going to start from a premise, that premise has to be supported by the century that you're referring to. And we've asked everybody to, rather than always coming from the 9th, 10th, 11th century, we are going up to the 12th century, or in this case, even the 14th century with 1322, we need to go back and see what was happening in the 7th century. And we've always assumed the 7th century, the Dome of the Rock is there. Nobody has disputed this idea that those inscriptions that we see there today are the inscriptions that Abdul Malik put there. Now, suddenly, A.J. Dios is saying, well, hold on a minute. Let's just go look and see what the people are saying. Let's just follow through. And you've done that. Uh, you've taken 10, 15 AD, the earthquake that happened there, uh, that the, the, the dome, the, the, it, it fell to pieces and restored again in 1022. Newly refurbished columns are put there. And I think what is interesting, that, that picture of the two columns, I'll just put it up here again. See this picture of the two columns. On the one side, uh, the inner ambulatory has been gone from eight to 12 columns. So it's increased the number of columns between the old and the new. And on the other side, the outer ones has decreased from 24 down to 16 columns. When you take and you refurbish columns, when you take out columns, you take that which, which they're holding up. And that the inscriptions are what they're holding up. And it's, you cannot therefore say that the inscriptions were, were left intact. That if there were any inscriptions, they would have had been replaced completely between uh, when those, those sets of columns were replaced. You went on to 
look at 1033, multiple earthquakes that hit that when you have earthquakes, you have damage. These would have damaged inscriptions if they exist. At 1047, the Persian Nasyib, referring to wood, not even to the, the beautiful columns that are made out of, what is it, uh, marble? And what other? Yeah, actually, yeah, I would just say that this is consistent with it being post an earthquake era. So you'd expect that if there was an earthquake just a couple of years, well, a couple of decades before that, you'd expect that there was no mosaics at that time because probably the earthquakes would have damaged what was there. So you'd expect it would have taken a while before any mosaics would have been put there. Okay, so we're talking about 14 years earlier, not even a couple of decades, yeah. just 14 years earlier when the earthquake hit in 1033. We're now 1047. 14 years later, this Persian yeah. Nasir mentions this is woodwork, which would be something that would replace it. You start yeah. with wood, and then you bring the more permanent type of marble or other uh, stonework that you would use. You went to 1092, and you talk about al Arabi says nothing about the inscription. That would be the first thing he would talk about. And it's not until 11. So we're talking the 12th century that you have the Russian abbot Daniel who refers to mosaics, but not inscriptions. What's interesting is you ended with 1322, John de Mandeville, saying that this was just a simple structure and that it actually the dome is twice as high as it should be today. It's, so I think in, in conclusion, what I'm, what I'm walking away from in this segment, in this episode, uh, really are the, the, the fact that nobody seems to notice these inscriptions, which are on the outer arcade, on either side of the outer arcade. And these inscriptions, by, by virtue of the fact that they're so important, uh, they are so pivotal to the whole message, the narrative that the Dome of the Rock is trying to make. With these earthquakes that have come out, the fact that you talked about the dome falling down in the earthquake. When the dome falls, when there's earthquake, the outer arcade where all the inscriptions are would be the first things to have been damaged. And even the fact that there are different columns in both the inner and the outer uh, from it goes, the inner goes from eight columns to 12 columns, proving that that has completely changed, but more damaging that than that. Or the outer column, the outer, outer arcade, if the fact that there were 24 columns, according to one description, that has been reduced to 16 columns later on, that's where all the inscriptions are. If you change the columns, you change the inscriptions. To me, that's, that's the, where the penny dropped for me when I was listening to you just now. And that's why it's fascinating that we don't get till 1322 when John of Demandeville says it was simple, and not really that it was simple, but the dome was itself looks like it was higher than it was wider. It's a completely different dome. This is the 14th century. So if that is the case, where did the dome that we have now, that we're looking at, when was it built? I'm not going to uh, throw your fire in that because I know you're going to talk about that, and I know Dios talks about that. But as we're up to the 14th century here, and we don't still have any clear indication that the dome we're looking at, the inscriptions we're looking at, were anything like what was there as late as the 14th century. This is 700 years after, after oh, of six to 700 years after Abdel Malik. Proof that we need to re we refigure everything we've talked about concerning how the Arabic changes, how the Quran changes, and how these verses within the Quran, because these are powerful verses. Chapter 4, verse 171. Chapter 112. When were they actually introduced on the Dome of the Rock? We've always said that these were the antecedents to the Quran. Looks like it may be the other way around. Okay, this has been fun. This has been great. Can't wait for the next segment. Thanks, Mel, for coming on board. Now, people, you do can comment. Uh, go ahead and do so. We like to hear what you're saying, but please, please, please keep, don't start telling us this is, we've been to the Dome of the Rock. We have seen what the inscription say. You guys are just lying because the inscription don't say what you're saying. We're, uh, please understand, we're asking historical questions here, not content of the, of the inscriptions you can read today. Basically, what Mel is saying is those inscriptions that you can read today were not there in the seventh century. As simple as that, they were added at a much later date. When? Hold on. We're going to answer that one in time. This is Mel and Jay, thousands of miles apart, over and out. Mm -hmm.